just uh, queue up music for Maddie. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I'm just going to introduce Maddie. Okay, let me... Come on, technology. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> All right, we're going to start today with a couple of really exciting performances. Um, first up, we have Maddie Shepard. Maddie's a performer and artist with Nevea Dance Circus from Norway, Maine. Um, and she works with Maine Youth for Climate Justice as a climate activist. I think Maddie's going to say a couple words. Hi, thank you. Um, I just want to say part of this dance was choreographed by Nettie Gentempo. She is the runner of Nevea Dance Circus in Norway, Maine, and normally it's performed as a group. So I had to um, modify it into a solo. It's titled the Ribbon Dance Piece. Um, the purpose of this dance is to evoke the mo emotion of happiness, especially during trying times like now. Uh, I would like to say that this dance is being performed by a queer artist as a tribute to members of the LGBTQ community that have walked or danced before me and those who will continue after. This is a reminder that you are loved, you are valid, and you should be so proud to be who you are. Reach out to NYCJ members if you'd like to join the queer cohort run by Anna Siegel and I, and uh, family, if you're watching this, hi, I'm not straight, representatives, if you hear me, hi, people in the crowd, this is me coming out. I'm not straight.
Thank you, Maddie. Can we get another round of applause for Maddie? Yeah. Um, and again, if folks are interested in joining the LGBTQ cohort with Maine Youth for Climate Justice, feel free to talk to Maddie um, afterwards. So next up, we have another fantastic performance um, from MOSI, uh, also known as Movements, Movement as a Seed for Change, um, which is a group that was created um, to challenge the ways that we internalize the systemic challenges that the world needs right now, collective care, listening, and stewardship among, among other practices. This piece of work was created for the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow, COP26, as a global dance for climate justice, uh, where we collected the voices and demands of more than 10 international activists who couldn't travel to the UN Conference in Glasgow. Today, this group is presenting it in its main form to all of you. Please join us in this movement towards change. Um, and at the end of the performance, there is going to be an option to join in in some body percussion. We invite you all to join in. Um, today, performing, we have COA students, College of the Atlantic students, Kaya, Margit, Tanvi, Gabriella, Izzy, and Angie. stewardship, um, this increase in water temperature obviously leading to the uh, impacts on fish and forest practices, um, increases in air temperature leading to increased invasive species, and we talk about tanks. The Penobscot River and the Penobscot Indian Reservation has sustained my for 10 to 12,000 years. We as the human race do have a very sacred responsibility to make sure that these resources are conserved and protected for future 
generation schools here. Thrown into the fire He's a careless man A desolate and die And I'm not the only one Searching for core, a glacier turned to sea, a poison from the oil, only two degrees. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. And thank you to all of our performers this morning. What a great way to start off our rally this morning. Um, welcome everyone to the 2022 Youth Day of Action. Woo! Woo -hoo! Um, my name is Anya Wright. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Bar Harbor um, and I work with the Sierra Club and with Maine Youth for Climate Justice. And I'm so, so excited to be here with you all today um, for our rally for climate justice and, and swift and bold action. Um, this event would not be possible without uh, the hard work of Maine Youth for Climate Justice, Just Me for Just Us, uh, Mia Changemakers, Maine Youth Power, and Maine Youth Action, as well as adult allies from Maine Climate Action Now and its member groups and the Nature-Based Education Consortium. We have some schools here from all over the state today. Um, we have folks here from Camden Hills Regional High School, um, from Falmouth High School, Woo! Yarmouth High School, Woo! Lincoln Academy, Woo! Woo! yeah, Lincoln Academy, um, the Ecology Learning Center, Woo! MDI High School, Woo! Waterville High School, Woo! and Brunswick High School. Um, we've also got folks here from College of the Atlantic, Woo! Colby College, Woo! and UMaine. 
Are there any other schools here that I didn't shout out? All right, cool. <laughs> you all did a good job of registering. Um, so um, across the globe today, young folks uh, are leading the fight for bold climate action and climate justice. In 2019, we gathered here uh, to demand that legislators, corporate leaders, and people in positions of power commit to taking the necessary action to mitigate and adapt to climate change on the time scale that, chi that science and justice require. We demanded that legislators in this state publicly recognize that climate change is an issue that is currently happening and exacerbating existing inequalities globally and locally. We demanded that legislators listen to and lift up marginalized and youth voices in the decision-making process, especially where the future is concerned. We demanded comprehensive climate education in schools. We demanded a Green New Deal that prioritizes climate, social, racial, and economic justice and paves the way to a sustainable society. We demanded a just transition to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Progress, yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, progress has been made since 2019, but we have a long way to go. Federally, our Congress is stalling to pass the Build Back Better bill to support climate action. Globally, emissions are continuing to rise with the recent uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report um, saying that the world is on course to warm by 2.7 degrees Celsius and that action must happen now or never. Our futures are at stake. Our state has been a leader in some ways nationally on climate action, but we are nowhere close to addressing the issue on the systemic level it needs. Today, you'll hear from seven youth speakers updating us on the state of our 2019 demands and where they stand today. First speaking to us this morning is Anna Siegel. Anna Siegel is a sophomore at Wayne Fleet High School and a core member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice and campaigns coordinator of Maine Youth Action. Please welcome Anna. Hello. Oh. Hi, my name is Anna Siegel and I'm so happy to be here today and I'm so glad that you all are here. I'm here to speak about our first demand that legislators, corporate leaders, and all people in positions of power commit to taking the necessary action to mitigate and adapt to climate change on the time scale that science and justice require. Hi. In February, uh, early last school year, I got an email from Representative O'Neill of Sacco, who is with us today. Uh, and she was excited that since I had co-hosted an event on divestment that past April, I could help her write and advocate for a bill about it. I didn't want to correct her, but my minimal divestment experience, which is that I had thrown together that one event to do a little bit of education, and nor mentioned that I had never done advocacy within the main legislature before, because I was a strikes organizer doing events like this, not a policy person. And so I said yes, and that I was happy to learn, um, and dove into that process. I ended up having a call with Representative O'Neill in a broom closet at my school, since it was early in my freshman year at an, as a new kid and I did not know where the confer conference rooms were. Yet in that cramped space, Maggie, Cassie Kane of, of Maine Youth for Climate Justice and I charted a course to craft legislation that would divest Maine from the $1.3 billion we have invested in fossil fuels, a bill called LD99. You all may know the rest of the story, which is that the bill passed last session, making Maine the first state in the country to mandate divestment through legislation. I was actually away on an ill-timed vacation when the bill was officially signed into law by Governor Mills because the voting process took longer than expected. So it ended up lasting until the summer where I was trekking across the deserts of Utah and Arizona without any cell service. I will never forget climbing out of Zion Canyon on a sweltering afternoon and we are restocking our camping supplies in a tiny trading post town in a, that looked straight out of a Wild West movie and we got one bar of service, and it was enough to hear that all of our hard work and the efforts of activists at Maine Youth for Climate Justice had come to fruition, and that we had, di and we had started the process of divestment. 
my dad probably thought I had a heat stroke uh, because I was like, you know, crying and joy. It was, it was an incredible moment. Um, but passing LD99 is not the end. It's not the end of my activism or work on divestment. Having been plugged now into the national network of advocates pushing for divestiture, I now advise other states on what worked for us and how they can replicate the success. It's crazy to now be regarded as someone to talk to about a subject that not too long ago just sounded like financial legalese. The next state target is, you know, people have been working to divest California, but I think it'd be great to see Massachusetts go next, which means that us Maine students can help them out. Out of all these targets and goals, I am most excited about Divest UMS, which is the University of Maine system. Uh, dozens of colleges and universities have divested across the country and world, including the University of California system, UCS, in 2020. That shows it is high time for the University of Maine system to do the same. We must also hold the state and the Maine Public Employees Retirement System accountable and ensure that they implement LD99 and fully divest the $1.3 billion by 2026, along with providing yearly reports on their progress. And thank you. And quick chant, if you say it with me, it's divest, reinvest. Ready? Divest, reinvest. Divest, reinvest. Divest, reinvest. Divest, reinvest. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Anna. Um, all right, next up we have uh, Audrey Huffnagel. Um, also, it's Audrey's birthday today. <laughs> yeah, some extra love from Lincoln Academy. All right, um, Audrey is a sophomore um, in high school from Damerscotta, Maine, and a member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice and Maine Youth Action. Welcome, Audrey. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here and have you all here on my birthday, which is great. I live in the tiny town of Damariscotta in Midcoast, Maine. From my house, I can walk to the Damariscotta River, a unique and beautiful estuary, home to a variety of wildlife, including seals, fish, and birds. Throughout the year, I love to hike and run on the beautiful trails and natural places around my home. Maine is known for its beautiful environment from its sweeping coastline to the peak of Mount Katahdin. This environment is essential for farmers and fishermen. It is what attracts tourists to the state who fuel our economy. In other words, Maine's environment is essential to our way of life, and protecting it is crucial if we want to preserve the qualities that make our state so unique. Currently, Maine's environment and these beautiful places are facing serious threats, the largest of these being climate change. Even where I live, I am already seeing the impacts of climate change. Warming waters are hurting the fishing and oyster industries in my town, which are important for the local economy. Rising sea levels and extreme weather events often cause flooding in the, flooding in the Main Street parking lot. But I am privileged. The effects that I am witnessing are nothing compared to what is already being experienced by people around the world. Floods, droughts, fires, extreme weather events, these impacts do not affect everyone equally. Black communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, people who identify as LGBTQ+, women, and marginalized communities are much more impacted by the climate crisis. All people deserve to have a clean and healthy environment. And for many, climate change is putting that right at risk. I have a younger brother and cousins, and I want them to be able to enjoy the natural places that I have enjoyed growing up and to have a future where they can thrive. Climate change is jeopardizing this as well. It will be me, my brother, my cousins, our generation, who will deal, have to deal with the worst impacts of, climate, of cl the climate crisis if immediate action is not taken to address it. Leaders need to take action now to address the climate crisis and protect the right of our generation and future generations to have a healthy and livable environment. This is what makes the Pine Tree Amendment so important. The Pine Tree Amendment will protect this right to clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment for all people and for future generations. Even though the Pine Tree Amendment did not pass in the House, the fight for these fundamental rights is not over. Woo! 
Change like that which will be brought about by the Pine Tree Amendment doesn't just happen. We have to fight for it. But sometimes even all the effort we put in isn't enough. Sometimes we lose. Sometimes it can feel hard and hopeless, but we don't give up. We can't give up. Not on the Pine Tree Amendment and not on the planet. We will keep fighting. I have seen so much energy from my fellow young people around the Pine Tree Amendment. And as we continue this fight, I would encourage even more young people to get involved. This bill is about protecting our future. We will be the ones who will be inheriting the planet, and we cannot wait until we are adults to protect it. By then, it will be too late. We are the future, and we can do this together. Together, we will fight for a clean and healthy environment, and for a future where we all can thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. All right, next up we have Lakota Sanborn. Lakota is a Penobscot community organizer, environmental and racial justice advocate. Welcome Lakota. Hello, my name is Lakota Sanborn. I'm from Indian Island. Um, from the Turtle Clan. It's really great to be here. It's good to see everybody. Um, I wanted to start off by acknowledging the space that we're in. We are on uh, Kusinuk, and this space is uh, traditional Abenaki uh, Kennebec territory. This is land that was unseated, that was stolen through violence and warfare and genocide, and uh, causing many of the Abenaki people from this region to flee into diaspora where they remain today amongst the other tribes in the, in the state of Maine and in uh, Quebec, in the uh, Odenak and Molenac uh, communities. I wanted to speak to tribal sovereignty today because there's two, well, there's a few, few very important bills. Um, two that I'm going to speak to today is uh, LD 1626 and LD 906. Um, first and foremost, I want to state that indigenous sovereignty is not something that can be granted to us by the state of Maine or any other colonial government. Tribal sovereignty is something that we have always had as sovereign nations, as a people. Um, our sovereignty is passed down to us through our creator and it's inherited through our ancestors. These, these are things that have been passed down since time immemorial for thousands of years. We have been here a lot longer than the state of Maine the state house has been here. <laughs> so that, that piece out of the way, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background for those, those of you who might not know much about LD 1626. Um, and I'll try to keep this brief. Um, the state of Maine since its incorporation in 1820 has sought to erase and undermine the fact that we are sovereign governments, that we are independent nations. And through a series of court cases and legal battles and policy adoptions, as well as the theft of traditional territory of the, uh, of the tribes in Maine, the, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this, this, uh, these acts essentially led to the 1970s where these things would continue. And in the 1970s, the tribes found that the lands that were seized and the treaties that were signed were in violation of the United States Constitution because these treaties needed to have the ratification by the United States Congress, but they never had ratification. And so during the 1970s began this process of seeking out a land claims. Um, this land claim proposed by the tribes found that the tribes had the um, the tribes had the legitimate claim of over 60% of the land mass of the state of Maine. Um, similar situation to what we saw in McGirt versus Oklahoma. I don't know if many of you followed that, but essentially this land claims case saw a bolstering of racism that was exacerbated by local media and it was exacerbated by local politicians, um, state leaders, and industry leaders especially. And so during this time, we as tribes decided to take a settlement with the state of Maine, seeing that there was a lot of benefit that could come out of, uh, out of a settlement um, 
in terms of being able to reacquire some of the land that was owed to us um, with some money that the state of Maine agreed to. And essentially within this settlement act that was passed in 1980, there is much language within it that's very problematic that was intentionally constructed to seek to undermine our sovereignty, to place us under the jurisdiction and authority of the state of Maine government. And this is something that doesn't happen anywhere else across the United States. No other federally recognized tribe in the country has this level of oversight from a state government. It's completely unprecedented. And so with LD 1626, this bill is seeking to address a lot of these structural issues that we keep coming up against, where the state of Maine keeps asserting its dominance and telling us that we don't have the sovereign right to control what happens within our lands. We don't have the right to um, control what happens to our own bodies in, an, in our own communities. And so LD 1626 is really important to be passed this legislative session. With the passage of LD 1626, the state of Maine has the ability to begin addressing the long tradition of racism and paternalism towards the Wabanaki tribes. A paternalism that I again state is entirely unique within the United States. The state of Maine must cease attempting to rewrite its own body of Indian law that runs parallel and in many instances counter to the federal level. There's a chance to address much of the harm within the Settlement Act that we have been experiencing for the past 40 years in LD 1626. And so I implore you to urge all of your legislators, your senators, your, uh, your representatives, um, and even Janet Mills, because as has been clearly evident, Janet Mills is not supportive of, of uh, recognizing our sovereignty, of respecting our sovereignty as nations. Um, she's pretty much clear as day said that she's going to veto this bill. But it is up to us to stand in this moment together, to take our power, and to tell future generations essentially that we did everything in our power to make sure that we were you know, working towards justice for Wabanaki people, right? The second bill that I wanted to touch on is LD906. This is uh, an act to provide, oh, I don't know if I have the official name, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. Um, this seeks to address an issue that's been going on for decades in the uh, community of Sabayak in uh, Pleasant Point, Maine, where they don't have access to clean drinking water. This has been happening for 40 years plus, right? Where their water is filled with um, toxic chemicals and carcinogens. This, this water is filled with neurotoxins and consistently tribal members are having to go off reservation to travel to pick up water. In many instances, they're trucking in water. Um, in cases where people aren't able to secure clean drinking water, they're having to drink it out of the tap. They're bathing their kids in this water. And again, it's toxic. It's toxic to ingest and it's poisonous to even have on your skin. LD906 was drafted by Rena Newell, who was the uh, Passamaquoddy tribal representative. And she drafted this bill with three intentions in mind to, to resolve this crisis. Uh, one of which will allow the tribe to put land that it already owns into trust, which will allow it to be able to set and regulate water quality within within those areas. Um, I'm sorry, it would allow them to uh, to dig wells in those areas and be able to to bring water to their tribe. And there's another piece of it that allows th uh, the EPA to set the water quality standards um, for tribal lands, which is vitally important because. The state of Maine is uh, showing that it doesn't want to allow the tribes to be able to do so. Um, and the third piece of this is the uh, alleviating a tax burden on the, the existing um, water district, which remains the only water district in the state that does not have, uh, that is required to pay taxes. And if they didn't have to pay taxes, they could afford to replace the filter that they need to keep that water clean. So those three areas are vitally important. And again, this just got voted on uh, yesterday, I think, in the House, and it passed there. Yeah? So, <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. So it passed there with an overwhelming majority. And today, it's getting voted on um, in the Senate. So this is, again, crucially important 
This is like this is for the future, right? This is an ongoing crisis, and it will continue to be a crisis unless we can take the steps necessary to stop it. And so I really implore you all to go speak to your senators today um, before the session and just really, really urge them to support LD906. Um, that's all I have. Thank you so much. Good job, Thank you. Thank you so much, Lakota. And again, um, that's bill number 1626 and 906 and as Lakota said um, 906 is going to be voted on in the Senate today um, and 1626 not sure but soon <laughs> maybe Thursday um, but great opportunity for us to talk to our legislators today about both of those bills um, I want to take a moment Haley Talbert are you here Oh, great. <laughs> I want to invite Haley from Falmouth High School to read a short poem for us all. Hello. I'm really grateful to be here today in the company of such amazing people doing such amazing work for our environment in Maine. Today I'm presenting two poems that are a part of my collection of poetry that's going to be published in August. Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> um, so today, yeah, I'm presenting two poems that are part of my collection of poetry that focus on the stress and uncertainty of climate change and our future in the face of climate change and the climate crisis. So my first poem today is called Preparing Soup in a Hurricane. Preparing Soup in a Hurricane. The forecast drops the storm onto the burner. Prep time 15 minutes, cook time 30 minutes. The sky buys gales, surges, and torrents from the grocery store. Place ingredients on cutting board. Ocean pours from the faucet, measures water into ditches and potholes. Fill five cups of tap water, place stock pot on stove. Waves slice through beachfront fences. Chop celery, cut on bias for larger pieces. Gusts of wind shuck shingles from roofs. Sprinkle in corn, discard the husks. Airborne twigs grate chips of paint off cheap siding. Take two large carrots, shred into flakes. Jagged branches cut through convertible sunroofs. Using a serrated knife, chop potatoes in half. Froth surges around lobster boats pitching in the harbor. Bring water to a boil, stir with wooden spoon. Dead pine needles pepper crooked sandbars. Add a pinch of allspice and a few bay leaves. But in the eye of the storm, the sky tastes comforting and warm. Ladle the soup into bowls and enjoy. And my second poem is called, When Land Becomes Fire. When the dry ground fractures to reveal its rib cage, the earthy reek of muscle and sinew will waft through barren trees once laced with the scent of sage. Wildfires will consume forests and spread cinders aloft. Ashes will soar in the breeze with birds that fly, migrating flocks beginning to choke, dropping out of a smoke-filled sky to rot under the shade of, of a skeletal oak. Starving creatures without leaves or fruits to consume will cower in the landscape of hell. Bleeding out to water parched tree roots, animals will die, their carcasses will swell. Footprints can never mar the earth's bones. Nature always prevails, but at what cost? Humans cannot destroy what the earth owns after everything has already been burnt and lost. Yes, the embers will crumble, seared over again, flames rising to scorch all that was left. The world will be reduced to a blaze when the ears that heard our cry fall deaf. Nature will rise in all of her might stacking us as the kindling to ignite. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Haley. Um, before we go to our next speaker, I want to do that climate justice chant again, and I want us to say it loud enough that our legislators in the state house can hear us. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. What do we want? Climate justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. Louder, louder, louder. What do we want? When do we want it? Now. Woo, that's what I like to hear. Woo. All right. So um, our next speaker today is Kosi Afeji. Um, Kosi is a high school senior, intersectional climate justice activist, and environmental steward from Bangor, Maine. They are here with the Maine Environmental Education Associ Association and the Nature-Based Education, uh, Education Association. Um, and Emily, I see you getting your picture taken, but if you could come up here <laughs> to show everyone that beautiful poster. Um, and I also want to uh, invite up uh, Representative Lydia Bloom, um, who is the sponsor of the bill that Kosi's going to talk about. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, I'm just going to wait until we have Representative Lydia Bloom up here. Well, good morning, everyone. It's really nice to see all of your beautiful faces on this amazing day. And uh, my name is Kosi Fiji, and I'm a senior at Bangor High School. I've been in the main public education system for most of my life, and in that time, climate change has been brought up as a part of the formal cu curriculum once. During my freshman year earth science class, we had a two-week unit on the carbon cycle and the greenhouse effect. After that, we never talked about climate change again. Not only was I upset at the fact that this unit was so short, but I was also upset that this unit did not cover the ways climate change affected our planet, ha is affecting our planet now or how climate change disproportionately affects people of certain identities or how it affects our state. But the thing that I was most upset about is that we didn't talk about climate change in the classroom sooner. But my, climate, but my lack of climate education is not unique to my school district. Many students across the state do not have access to comprehensive climate education and this needs to change. LD 1902, I do not have the formal um, bill title because it's very long, um, is, a way, is a way for our state to finally, finally start to remedy the issue by providing support for those who need it most, teachers. Teachers are the ones who will be teaching about climate change, so they need all the support in the world to do so. LD 1902 will allow school districts to apply for grant funding for professional development opportunities so that teachers of all grade levels can, have, can find a way to educate their students on this pressing issue. Climate education is already a part of the next generation science standards and this bill is only a way to help students meet those standards. Additionally, climate education is a part of the Maine Won't Wait Climate Action Plan. This bill already aligns with the state's climate goals, and now it's time to bring it to fruition. I've been working on LD 1902 for about a year now, and I'm so happy to say that it is pa passed in both chambers of the legislature. <laughs> Even though this is the case, the fight is not over yet. This bill will create a $3 million grant program, and it needs to be funded by the Appropriations Committee. Okay, so if so, raise your hands if you're from Thalmouth, Saco, or Sangerville. Is anyone here from those? Yes, okay, I love to see it. So um, you have the opportunity to talk directly to your senators who happen to be on the Appropriations Committee um, about funding this bill. Now raise your hands if you are from York, New Gloucester, Bangor, Lewiston, Wyndham, Madison, Raymond, Eagle Lake, or Waterford. Yeah, yeah, I love to see it. Wonderful. So um, your, your House representatives are also on Appropriations Committee, so I urge you to talk to them about funding this bill as well. Um, so first of all, I would just like to say a special thank you to Representative Lydia Bloom for sponsoring this bill and just being along with us for this journey and <laughs> um, really pushing, it, pushing for it um, in the legislature. So thank you just so much for your work in there. And also, this is just a little visual about um, the way in which the bill um, could be funded 
first at the three million dollar level to hypothetically provide funding for three school districts per county but even if it's not funded at the full three million dollar level if it was funded at the one million dollar level then there would be an opportunity for one hypothetically one school district per county um to apply and to get grant money to um uh, for to provide climate education for the school districts and I understand that my time in the main in the main public school system is almost over and I won't get to experience this bill come to fruition but I won't get and oops I missed my spot <laughs> but I hope that but my hope is that all students across the state are equipped with the knowledge and uh, the knowledge they need to deal with one of the biggest issues facing our generation today thank you Thanks so much, Kosi. All right. Um, next up, I want to invite Amara Feji up. Um, Amara is an environmental justice advocate from Bangor, Maine. Uh, she is the director of youth engagement and policy for the Maine Environmental Education Association and a student at Northeastern University. Um, and I also want to invite up Deb. Um, Deb is a, joined the Maine Environmental Education um, and the Nature Conservancy as the Changemakers Climate Action resident, working on various climate action strategies. Um, they strongly advocate for social and environmental justice for BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus communities, um, anti-colonialism, indigenous rights, sustainability, environmental preservation, and intersectionality and equity within each of these causes and beyond. Welcome to Amara and Deb. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, just super duper excited to be here with you all today. Um, I'm getting such like mushy gushy feelings seeing the crowd. So um, I just wanna thank you all because it means so much um, to be able to be here in community together. Um, so as Anya said, my name is Amara. And I'm Deb, I've been holding the sign here. <laughs> Um, and we're going to be speaking today about um, one of our demands, which is um, having the um, state of Maine adopt the recommendations of the equity subcommittee. So we are here today calling on the state of Maine to implement the recommendations given by the equity subcommittee to ensure a healthy future for all present and future Mainers. As we know, the climate crisis is more than an environmental issue. It is a social issue, one of inequity. Therefore, we need everyone at the table if we are to face the effects of a changing climate and tackle these inequities head on. In particular, people of color like ourselves, lower income and frontline communities must be engaged and informed because they are the ones who face the disproportionate impacts of climate change. However, it is these same groups of people who are often left out of climate conversations, which only often center technical solutions rather than glaring inequities. And if these perspectives are highlighted, it is often to ensure that a box is checked rather than meaningfully engaging those most affected by the issue. The recommendations outlined by the Equity Subcommittee would aim to counter the exclusion of these communities from critical climate conversations. I'll say that three times. Stakeholder and decision-making processes would be centered on equitable equitable participation of underserved communities, including providing childcare, transportation, and translators. Gentrification and forced displacement would be an issue the state would invest time into researching. In the energy sector, we would ensure the state considers disposal of byproducts so that they are not displaced to marginalized communities and communities of color as they often are. And ensure the, that lower income communities of color in particular have access to green spaces which promote their social and emotional well-being. These recommendations and the others outlined by the Equity Subcommittee commit the state to addressing the burdens lower income communities of color continue to bear due to the climate crisis. As a way to begin to address centuries of harm, it is imperative that the state of Maine adopts these recommendations and creates the policies that ensure a more just and livable future. Let us have today be the day where these wrongs are rewritten. Thank you.
Thank you, Amara and Deb. Um, can we just get one big round of applause for all of our speakers today? We still have a few left, but there are just some truly incredible, incredible young folks in this state, including all of you here today. Um, and it's just such an honor to be here in community with all of you, especially after such a hard couple of years um, with the pandemic, um, climate change, and the many the many pandemics that we're living through currently. So just big, big feelings of gratitude for everyone here today and all of our speakers. Um, I want to invite our last two speakers up to the stage, um, Emily and Cole. Um, Emily is uh, studying sustainable energy management at Unity College um, in Unity, Maine, um, and a core member of Maine Youth for Climate Justice. Um, she's also on the board of Our Power. Uh, and Cole is a junior at Thornton Academy and the legislative director for Maine Youth Action. Um, and before they hop up here too, I just wanna shout out uh, Representative Seth Berry and Representative Nicole Grahowski, um, who, are the <laughs> who are here in the middle of their voting day. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and they're also um, the leads and sponsors of the bills that uh, Emily and Cole will be talking about. So thank you both. A little tall for this. I want to first thank you all today for coming. Events like Youth Day of Action are imperative in showing our government and our state that we care and we will advocate. And it is people like yourselves that make it happen. So I first want to thank you for that. We are facing an existential crisis that jeopardizes our future, desecrates our environment, and threatens our very way of life. Climate change is on the rise. We know it. They know it, everyone knows it. We have acknowledged the looming threat that is upon us today, and we must take bold and equitable action to combat what we are all collectively confronting, which is why I came here today to specifically speak about clean energy. Clean energy is a crucial element to our climate approach. The lights we turn on in our room, the phones we charge, the houses we heat are all sourced from electricity coming from fossil fuels. As a state, we have a golden opportunity to change our grid to renewables. We must seize this opportunity with a firm grip. This is the time to lower our energy cost. This is the time to reduce our emissions. And this is the time to make a major commitment to the climate movement. This is the bold action we shall support. This opportunity is before us today. LD 1634, an act to create the main generation authority is the bill that will aggressively accelerate our clean energy transition while saving the Mainers billions of dollars. This bill passed the House Monday, 72 to 64. This is a tremendous victory, a tremendous victory, but only a step in the process to make this a reality. They need the youth, the generation that will be affected by this, to tell them to take meaningful action now. Every single one of you can make the difference that is so desperately needed by crowding those halls and making them aware that the state's future wants LD 1634 to pass. We are the change and we shall bring about the change. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for being here today. Your presence today is activism in itself and it speaks volumes to your parents your peers and your legislators, that you see the climate crisis directly impacting your life and you see a need to make a change. For generations, we have followed a destructive hunger for fossil fuel sourced energy. This hunger has led to war, poverty, and the destruction of our planet with the energy industry accounting for the largest contribution of greenhouse gas emissions. Justice for our planet and our most vulnerable communities cannot be sought without addressing the need for renewable energy. The lack of concrete action and urgency from our legislators is appalling. As the next generation of Mainers, our future depends on the just and effective, I'm sorry, <laughs> our future depends on the action that we take today and that action must be bold, just, and effective in addressing both the energy needs of our community and our right to a healthy planet and a livable future. There are two concrete and effective means to meet, to meet these needs today in our legislature. And those are LD 1634, an act to create the main generation authority, which Cole spoke about, and Amendment B of LD 1959, an act to ensure transmission and distribution utility accountability. 
We have seen victory in the House with LD 1634 yesterday, and we should absolutely celebrate that victory, but we cannot be satisfied. Our electric utilities are the backbone of our energy sector, and without their total commitment and accountability, we cannot achieve a future of renewable energy. A utility that actively poses obstacles to renewable energy development, abuses our most vulnerable citizens, and offers the least reliable electricity in the nation cannot be left unchecked without consequence. The sole purpose of these investor-owned utilities is to make a profit. Without fundamentally changing this structure or the way that these utilities are held accountable, there will be no energy justice. And we cannot demand change with no action. Today, each and every one of you has a powerful story and a unique voice. And you can share that with your legislators and urge, the, urge them to hold these utilities accountable in a meaningful way by passing Amendment B of LT, LD 1959 and to continue to pass LD 1634 through the Senate to continue investment into a future where we can thrive on clean, sustainable energy that provides hope for us. We are the future. You guys are the future. And I do have a little chant. So it's one, two, three, four, fossil fuels out the door, five, six, seven, eight, renewable energy in our state. I know it's a lot, but you guys can do it. Ready? Okay. One, two, three, four, fossil fuels out the door, five, six, seven, eight, renewable energy in our state. One, two, three, four, fossil fuels out the door, five, six, seven, eight, renewable energy in our state. Woo, thank you guys. Thank you, Cole and Emily. All right, one more round of applause for all of our speakers today. Woo! Okay, um, and I know we just talked about a lot of bills, a lot of numbers, um, so we do have some fact sheets over on the table over there. Allison's waving one, woo! Um, feel free to grab one. Um, now we're gonna head into the halls um, to go and talk to our elected officials. Um, so feel free to grab one of those sheets. Um, we're going to go into the halls for about an hour and then meet back out here for lunch, um, do a little networking. We'll have some tabling um, and have some time to get to know one another. Um, the uh, legislature meets on the third floor. Um, and when you get there, you can look for adults wearing orange stickers. Um, those are, um, oh, thanks, Zach. Um, those are folks that are there to help us um, identify our legislators and help with any questions that you might have. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you all so much for being here today. Oh, yeah. Um, so, um, and just a little bit more housekeeping. Um, if anyone from the media has any questions, our speakers will be available um, right after this. Um, and also someone dropped their phone. Um, and if you're missing it, it's up here. Um, thank you all so much again. Um, let's go tell our legislators what we want. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>